Hello everyone, it is Mr. J here. It is now August. Isn't that crazy? School will be starting in like two weeks. Well, technically, we'll be starting online and all of that. Still a lot of uncertainty, but I figure we might as well just keep chugging ahead and we will handle whatever comes our way. So we've been talking about the Industrial Revolution and various aspects that well the first video was about you know why did it happen in england why didn't it happen somewhere else why did it start there and there were i mean arguably there's a lot of accidents of geography europe just happens to be where a big jurassic era um uh, forest was like 65 million years ago there's also um, things around institutions of private property, things like that. So that was what the first video was about. The second video in this series was about social changes that is brought about by uh, industrialism. We talked about um, the new cla class structure, and we also talked about class mobility um, and overall how people are getting richer from all of this in general. But even then, I mean, I, I certainly would not want to get in a time machine and go back and live and have to work in a, you know, 16 hours in a factory. It would be really bad. But I'm saying that from the position of someone, you know, a school teacher in the 21st century recording something on Zoom and then putting it on YouTube. So, but you have to keep in mind, you have to compare like things with like things. And a lot of people made the choice to move to those cities to work in the factories because let's face it, farm work sucks and it's a lot harder, you know, not as consistent and not as, not as many guarantees. Um, we also talked about the growth in the labor movements. We talked about laissez-faire capitalism and those ideas, Adam Smith and all of that. We also talked briefly about socialism and of course, I have a whole other video on Marxism and communism. But today, we're going to be talking about the second industrial revolution. So this is happening. There's like two phases to the industrial revolution as a whole. The first two videos were talking about, um, oh, uh, they were talking about the first industrial revolution, which happened in the late 1700s, early 1800s, but around the 1870s, there's, and then moving forward into the 20th century, there is the second industrial revolution where there are new innovations in technology, new innovations in how you produce something. So for instance, like the assembly line as shown here, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And this second industrial revolution is where stuff starts to get a little crazy. Lots of different things. So here's our learning objectives for this video. We're going to describe the impact of new technology on industry, transportation, and communication. We're going to understand how big business emerged. We're going to summarize the impact of medical advances in the late, eight, late 1800s. We're going to describe how cities changed and grew. So we're going to explain how conditions for workers gradually improved. So let's get this ball rolling. Science and technology change industry. The first phase of the industrialization was forged from iron, powered by steam, and driven by British textile industry. By the mid-1800s, the Industrial Revolution was entering a new phase in which new factories powered by new sources of energy used new processes to turn out new products, new, 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 new. At the same time, new forms of business organization led to the rise of giant new companies. So that's gonna be a theme, eh? Lots of changes gonna happen, new, new, new. Moving on. So one of these big changes is the Bessemer process. It helps to improve the output and quality of steel. This is developed by uh, British engineer Henry Bessemer and American inventor William Keeley. 
they developed a new process for making steel from iron. In 1856, Bessemer patented this process. The steel was lighter, harder, and more durable than iron, so it could be produced very cheaply. Steel quickly became the major material used in tools, bridges, and railroads. As steel production soared, industrialized countries measured their success in steel output. In 1880, for example, the average German steel mill produced less than 5 million metric tons of steel a year. That's a lot of tons. By 1910, so 30 years later, that figure had reached nearly 15 million metric tons. So the Germans tripled their steel output which will be very, very important moving forward. Uh, we also have, and we, here we see the Bessemer process in, in process. Um, so this is kind of the layout of, what would this call, a furnace. But then this is just kind of to scale, to show how big these things are. They're huge, they're huge. We also have innovations in chemistry. During the same period, chemists created hundreds of new products from medicines such as aspirin to perf perfumes and soaps. Newly developed chemical fertilizers played a key role in increasing food production. In 1866, the Swedish chemist Alfred Nobel invented dynamite, an explosive much safer than others used at the time. It was widely used in construction and, to Nobel's dismay, in warfare. Dynamite earned Nobel a huge fortune, which he willed to fund the famous Nobel Prizes. So, Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. You know, pretty big deal. And turns out that people like killing people. And whenever there's like a new tech, have you ever noticed this? Whenever there's a new technology, people figure out a way to use it as a weapon. Um, so he invented dynamite. And he made a lot of money off of this, as you would, for the various reasons that we just discussed. And there was one time where he was reading the newspaper. He woke up one morning on April 15th, 1888, and he opened the newspaper and he saw his own obituary. A rumor had gone around that Nobel died. And so the obituary, Imagine reading your own obituary. What would they say about you? What would they say at the end of your life about how your life was led? I think most people would like it to be a positive obituary. Instead, this obituary, the front line said, the merchant of death is dead. Dr. Alfred Nobel, who made a fortune by finding ways to kill more people, faster than ever before, died yesterday, the merchant of death. So imagine, imagine opening the newspaper and reading your own obituary and finding out that a lot of people hate you and think you're a bad person. Well, this was a bit of a shock to him and it it was a moment for him to reflect upon his life and on his work. And so, after reading that, he decided to work on creating what is called the Nobel Prize. And initially, there's a bunch of different Nobel Prizes nowadays. There's prizes in economics and literature. But initially, it was the Nobel Peace Prize. And so he found this, he thought of this as a way of redeeming his legacy in a way of trying to forward mankind and make up for the sins of his past. We also have electricity. So here's an interesting question. Is it electricity or electricity? My wife says electricity and she is incorrect. Though it is a point of contention in our marriage and we are constantly vying for how, how will our son say it? That's kind of a contest we're gonna have moving forward. Is, is, is my son Graham gonna say electricity or electricity? Well, he better say electricity. In the late 1800s, a new power source, electricity, replaced steam as the dominant source of industrial power. 
scientists like Benjamin Franklin had tinkered with electricity a century earlier. Do you remember that story where he recruited some kid to hold a, hold a kite during a storm with a key on it? Oh, back when science had no ethics. Uh, the Italian scientist Alessandro Volta developed the first battery around 1800. Later, the English chemist Michael Faraday created the first example, sorry, first simple electric motor and the first dynamo, the machine that generates electricity. Today, all electrical generators and transformers work on the principles of Faraday's dynamo. In the 1870s, the American inventor Thomas Edison made the first electric light bulb. Soon, Edison's incandescent lamps illuminated whole cities. The pace of city life quickened and factories would, could continue to operate after dark. By the 1890s, cables carried electrical power from dynamos to factories. And to this day, electricity is one of the most important things that we have. Um, this laptop um, I'm recording this on is powered by electricity. The phone that you're listening to this on is powered by electricity. Your lamps, your fridges, your on and on and on and on. All of them are powered by electricity. And in many ways, we're vulnerable because of that. So for instance, there is such a thing as an electra, sorry, an electromagnetic pulse an EMP, and it can be generated from solar flares or from a nuclear attack. And what an EMP essentially does is it wipes out and kills all electronics in a certain area, just fries them, can't turn them on ever again. And so, especially for the United States, we are very, very vulnerable to this kind of thing because everything we do it relies on some form of electricity. I mean, if an EMP went off, you wouldn't even be able to start your car. I mean, think about that. Um, and so what's interesting is, you know, all you need to do for an EMP attack is put a nuke in the atmosphere, maybe 60,000 feet above Kansas or something like that. Maybe, no, because that, that's the cruising altitude of a, of a, a jetliner. It would have to be in the in the orbit. All you have to do is detonate a nuke over Kansas, and you basically wipe out the entire electric grid for the United States. So the United States is quite vulnerable to this kind of thing. Knock on wood. Hopefully it doesn't happen. But it could also happen by accident. Like I said, solar flares generate EMPs. Um, another thing I want to talk about that is not mentioned in the book, um, it should be because it's cool, there's also Nikola Tesla who worked with Edison, and there's, it's a contentious relationship, let's say. A lot of people claim that Edison stole ideas from Tesla, though I, I haven't seen all of the evidence pertaining to that. I'm sure that there's another side of the story. Um, but one thing that's interesting about Tesla, he was a little bit of a mad scientist. He was working on developing a death ray, <laughs> for instance his apartment in new york city oh tesla you live once more in elon musk but let's move on we also have improved methods of production the basic features of the factory system remained the same during the 1800s factories still used large numbers of workers and power driven machines to mass produce goods to improve efficiency however manufacturers designed products with interchangeable parts these are identical components that could be used in place of one another. Interchangeable parts simplified both the assembly and repair of products. By the end of the 1900s, manufacturers had introduced another new method of production, the assembly line. Workers on an assembly line add parts to a product that moves along a belt from one workstation to the next. A different person performs each task along the assembly line. While well, not all factories used assembly lines, the factory system was re always relied on the division of labor. Each worker was assigned one task, such as putting the sole of a shoe on a, sorry, sole on a shoe or sewing a collar on the shirt. Once that task was done, the worker handed the product to the next person, who then performed his or her task. 
interchangeable parts, the division of labor and the assembly line all made production more efficient. They lowered the price of factory goods, making them affordable to more people. And one reason that it became more efficient, I mean, for instance, if I had the time and the energy and the interest and the money, I could probably build a car all by myself. But how long would that take? A very, very, very long time, especially since I know nothing about cars. It would take a very, very long time. But if we have a team of people all working together, and my job is to you know, put the wheel on and tighten the bolts, and that's it. How long will it take me to get really good at putting that wheel on really fast. Probably wouldn't take too long. And so that's the idea of specialization. And that was a very key part of the assembly line is you have this one job. And because you are focused on this one job, you get really good at it and you get really quick at it. And all of these things increase efficiency and lower the price. So that way more people can buy it. So that way poorer people can buy it. Moving on. So here we see a, a graph shows a steel production, 1880 to 1910. We have millions of metric tons over here. We got different countries. And of course, USA, number one. I mean, what else do you expect? Um, but the important thing is the trend line. And it, we can see that it is growing very, very, very quickly especially in the United States, USA, USA. The electric dynamo shown here was invented by Michael Faraday in 1831. Dynamos generated the electricity used to power lights in factories and homes. And I forgot to mention two other things. So we were talking about EMP attacks and there is actually a way to counter an EMP attack. And that is to put something inside a Faraday cage. So this is, this is an object or a box or a cage that cancels out electromagnetic waves. So nothing can get in to fry the battery. So you can put things inside the Faraday cage and let's say an EMP happens and those objects, those items will be okay. So there is a way to counter the EMP. Along with this, um, what's important to mention is that what happens with these dynamos, and again, I'm no scientist, so I'm just giving you the layman's um, explanation. But essentially, there are parts that are moving, spinning, that are helping to generate electric current. But the, the question then is, what is powering those, uh, those items to move in that way? And increasingly, that is the burning of coal, the burning of oil, the burning of gasoline. So they are very, very reliant on fossil fuels to even keep going. And to this day, uh, there's a lot of coal-fired power plants, for instance. I think there's one near, there's one nearby. I think Flagstaff gets most of their energy from a coal-fired, coal-powered, <laughs> coal-fired power plant. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, all right, moving on. Advances in transportation and communication. During the second industrial revolution, transportation and communications were transformed by technology. Steamships replaced sailing ships and railroad building took off. In Europe and North America, rail lines connected inland cities and seaports, mining regions and industrial centers. In the United States, a transcontinental railroad provided rail service from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In the same way, Russians built the Trans-Siberian Railroad linking Moscow and European Russia to Vladivostok on the Pacific. Railroad tunnels and bridges crossed the Alps in Europe and the Andes in South America. Passengers and goods rode on rails in India, China, Egypt, and South Africa. So railroads are gonna be extremely important, particularly for military mobilization. And I've got other videos that talk about that the age of the automobile. 
The transportation revolution took a turn when a German engineer, Nikolaus Otto, invented a gasoline-powered internal combustion engine. In 1886, Carl Benz, who's this guy right here, invented a patent for the first automobile, which had three wheels and kind of looked like a dopey little tricycle. A year later, Gottlieb Daimler, Daimler introduced the first four-wheeled automobile. People laughed at the horseless carriages as they quickly changed the way people traveled. The French nosed out the Germans as early as automakers. Then the American Henry Ford, America, started making models that reached a breathtaking speed. Okay, hold up. So Henry Ford, American, starts making cars that are going very fast. Very, very fast. They go a whopping 25 miles per hour. Oh my gosh. In the early 1900s, Ford began using the atomic lines to mass produce cars, making the United States a leader in the automobile industry. But of course, what else can be expected? Um, and this was especially with the Ford Model T. And Henry Ford was very famous in saying um, that he wanted to make a car that his employees could buy and trust. So he was very, very focused on, he's not catering to the rich because they could afford the car, of course, but he's, he's trying to cater to the common person. And in so doing, he's able to sell a lot of cars, a lot of cars and make a lot of money as well. Um, one way that <laughs> excuse me, one way that uh, he drove the price down for the Model T is he didn't he he only had one one type. He was famously asked, "What color can I get the Model T in?" And Ford said, "You can get it in any color as long as it's black." So by making just the same car, the same exact one, no no fancy colors no fancy designs it's just the same thing um it is able to drive the price down I mean, this is a huge deal and the first airplane of course um lots of people had tried to make the airplane or make the flying machine leonardo da vinci very famously tried to create a, a, a flying machine and he has designs that were to that effect. Here we see some dopey guy. He's built basically a glider and he is about to jump off this cliff to test that. Which, I mean, good luck with that. <laughs> kind of crazy. But maybe we need that kind of crazy energy to try new things. Um, it did not go well for him. And there, there are whole video compilations of people trying out these newfangled flying machines. And every single time they fail horribly, which is, uh, again, we kind of need that kind of craziness to put us forward, to move us forward, try out new ideas. We need more broken legs to try out new inventions. Uh, but eventually, Pete's two brothers were able to figure it out in 1903. Orville and Wilbur Wright. They designed and flew a flimsy airplane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. What's important about this, though, is that they were not just gliding. Gliders had been invented, but what's important is that this plane was flying on its own power. Didn't go very far, but still, you did it. We did it, people. And guess where they're from? America. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just think about the bravery of doing it. I mean, just the everyone before them failed. Every single person failed. But they stuck to their guns, these two bicycle mechanics. And they did it. That's incredible. They beat gravity. They became one with the birds. They defied physics by using physics. And so, I mean, I really like this picture down here. 
where they're starting to fly and they've taken their hats off and they're cheering and you can just imagine the joy and like, oh my gosh, it's working and how excited and how happy they are. And it kind of makes me tear up a little. It's like they did it. Everyone told them it couldn't be done, but they did it anyway. That's amazing. It's a wonderful story. And of course, people in France, they're like, oh, oh, the Wright brothers say they've invented an airplane. That can't possibly be true. And then they show up at, in, at France, in France and they, they show them, look at our airplane, look at it go. And <coughs> it's amazing. It's wonderful. Um, a little embarrassing to the U.S. Army because the U.S. Army had already commissioned the building of something like this, a flying machine to try to figure it out. And then just two goobers who were bicycle mechanics figure it out. And so the uh, U.S. Army goes to them and says, hey, um, cool job. Little embarrassing that you did it before us. Uh, do you mind building us a bunch of these? We'll give you $10,000 for every one. And so Wilbur, Orville and Wilbur Wright stop being bicycle mechanics and they become the first airplane manufacturers. I mean, isn't, and even then, even then, there's a little, there's a dark side to that story because look at that. Humanity, we've created a new, brand new thing, a new innovation of science and technology, math and reason. Look what we can do when we apply ourselves. And of course, first customer, how can we use this to kill people? Doesn't that say something about the human condition a little bit? By the way, it's a very inspirational story. I don't know if there's any movies about it, though. There really should be movies about it. It's, a, it's an incredible thing. We also have a communications revolution. A revolution in communications also made the world smaller. An American inventor, Samuel F. B. Morse, developed the telegraph, which could send coded messages over wires by means of electricity. His first telegraph line went into service between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore in 1844. By the 1860s, an undersea cable was relaying messages between Europe and North America. The transatlantic cable was an amazing engineering accomplishment for its day. It wasn't the only one. Eventually, almost every major European country had their own cable along the bottom of the ocean to the United States. Communication soon became even faster. In 1876, the Scottish-born American inventor Alexander Graham Bell patented the telephone. By the 1890s, the Italian pioneer Guglielmo Marconi had invented the radio, which allowed wireless communication over long distances. In 1901, Marconi received a radio message using Morse code sent from Britain to Canada. As Marconi had predicted, radio soon became a key part of a global communications network that linked every corner of the world. Siberian Railroad began in 1891, where it continued on various parts of the line until 1916. And this looks like miserable work, I'll be honest. Siberia is not a fun place. That's why they built concentration camps there. Sorry, the Soviets did, I mean. Advances in communication during the Industrial Revolution. We got the telegraph, we got telegraph line, we got transatlantic cable, we got the telephone, we got the radio, we got all sorts of different things. The first long distance message on the telegraph line, 1844, what hath God wrought? That's a bit of a downer. <laughs> That's a little bit of a downer quote. Come on, Morse, you did something awesome. You built something really cool. Why you gotta be a downer about it? All right, moving on. The rise of big business. By the late 1800s, what we call big business came to dominate industry. Big business refers to an establishment that is run by entrepreneurs who finance, manufacture, and distribute goods or services on a large scale. As time passed, some big businesses became to control entire industries. Not entirely true. Um, 
to the best of my knowledge, there was no pure monopoly, as in they controlled 100% of the, uh, the market share. There were still competitors, but regardless, there were businesses that were developing that held a lot of the market share, upwards of like 80, 90%. Investors form corporations. The leap is technologies require the investment of large amounts of money or capital. To get the needed capital, owners sold stock or shares in their companies to investors. Each stockholder became owner of a tiny part of a company. Large scale companies such as steel foundries needed so much capital that they sold hundreds of thousands of shares. These businesses formed giant corporations, businesses that are owned by many investors who buy shares of stock. With large amounts of capital, corporations could expand into many areas. Now, what's really cool about stock, though, is that if it is, you know, an open option, if it's not an entirely private company, if it's one of these corporations, anyone can buy stock. As long as you got the money, you can buy a share. You can go right now and you can buy a share of Google. You can go buy a share of Facebook. I mean, it's going to be expensive, but you can buy a share. And so what's really interesting about this is that, and this is something that Karl Marx never predicted, the workers themselves could buy shares in the companies that they worked for. And that's something Karl Marx did not predict. Um, in fact, I mean, to the, right now in the United States today, Something like 55% of Americans own stock of some kind. A lot of people's um, retirement savings are in the stock market. A lot of five oh sorry, a lot of 401k money is in the stock market. Um, and so, I mean, think about that. Over half of Americans own stock of some kind. That's incredible. And something that Karl Marx never predicted. Monopolies, and I put that in quotes because it, it is super arguable, monopolies dominate industry. Some powerful business leaders created monopolies, hmm, arguable, and trusts. Huge corporate structures that controlled entire, arguable, not all of the industry, entire industries or areas of the economy. In Germany, Alfred Krupp, inherited a steel making business from his father. He bought up coal and iron mines along with supply lines that carried raw materials to feed the steel business. And this is called a vertical monopoly. So he owns basically every step of the way in terms of the production. Later, he and his son acquired plants that made tools, railroad cars, and weapons. And the Krupps are very, very famous for their weapons and for the armor plating that they would put on ships. They were so famous that um, <laughs> they would develop like artillery shells or something, or, or ship shells, I guess you could say, naval, naval artillery. They would invent, they would, the new improved shell can pierce any armor. And so everyone buys it up, buys it up, buys it up. And then they develop the new armor that can resist the new shell. <laughs> And then everyone buys that up. And then they come out with the new shell that can produce the new, that can pierce the other armor. And so it's a very, very effective business model, I will say. A little sleazy, a little bit profiting off of war, which generally speaking is kind of icky, but a very good business model. Um, crops are still around today, by the way. Um, the elevator, and this is going to be a really obscure reference, and the only reason I know this is because I worked there. The elevator at the Aquaplex was made by the Krupps. And I know that because I saw I worked there and I saw it on the little on the little description, like like the serial number, or whatever. It was a, from the Krupps. That's very interesting. In the United States, John D. Rockefeller dominated the petroleum industry by gaining control of oil wells, oil refineries, and oil pipelines. Andrew Carnegie, who started out as a poor, as a poor immigrant from Scotland, worked his way up to build an American steel empire. 
He later used his wealth to fund libraries, universities, and other charities, as well as you know, institutions of fine arts. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Sometimes a group of corporations would join forces and form a cartel, an association to fix prices, set production quotas, or control markets. In Germany, a single cartel fixed prices for 170 coal mines. Now, here's, here's part of the reason why I put monopoly in quotes, insofar as arguably these were not actually monopolies, insofar as, yes, they had a huge share market share of that particular industry, but it was not 100%. Furthermore, and connected to that, there were competitors. No one could stop you from competing against these monopolies. No one could stop you from setting up your own oil well and competing with John D. Rockefeller. It was not illegal to do so. Um, so there was no state backing them up. Um, along with that, you know, a lot of these companies, they become these kind of huge monopolies because they're buying up their competitors. But every time that you buy up one of the competitors, guess what? The price of the next one goes up. Uh, and it goes up to the point where it's no longer affordable to keep doing that strategy. And as for these cartels, very often these cartels, um, there's something called a prisoner's dilemma, wherein Let's say, okay, well, well, we'll just go with the cartel example. Let's say John D. Rockefeller wants to make a cartel of oil prices. So all these oil companies get together and they're gonna say, okay, the price of oil will be this and all of us agree to set it to that. However, there's a very strong incentive for at least one of those companies to break away from the cartel and lower their price. And once they lower the price, everyone flocks to them. And then the other companies follow. So the idea of a prisoner's dilemma is we can work together and benefit less. No, hold on. So a prisoner's dilemma is if we work together, we both benefit. But if I betray you, I benefit more. And there's an incentive for you to betray me first. So I better betray you before you betray me. That's the idea of a prisoner's dilemma. Opposing views on big business. The rise of big business sparked a stormy debate. Admirers saw the Krupps, Rockefellers, and Carnegies as captains of industry and praised their vision and skill. They pointed out that capitalists invested their wealth in worldwide ventures such as railroads, that employed thousands of workers and added to the general prosperity. They claimed that monopoly, well, this is super arguable. Mono, some people claim that monopolies increase efficiency by driving out less efficient corporations, not entirely the case. And also on top of this, these industrialists, you know, there's this image of Scrooge McDuck diving into a pool of gold coins and swimming around and look at all my money <laughs> but that's not really the case um there are no scrooge mcduck money vaults especially for these businesses a lot of the time the business is taking their profits and investing it into other aspects of the business to keep the business growing to keep it stable um other times like Carnegie, for instance, he donated like all of his money near the end of his life. He had so much money. He's like, well, and also part of it was he was a devout Christian. And so he gave to charities. He set up his own charities. He built hospitals. He built libraries. And he's not alone in this. A lot of these so-called robber barons did very similar things. Another thing, Rockefeller saved the whales. We're gonna say that again. Rockefeller saved the whales. So let me explain that just briefly. The whaling industry, you know, Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, oh, the white whale, oh, the white whale. 
they would go and spear whales to death and then drag them back to New York or Boston or wherever and cut down the whale and process it. And they would take the whale oil, and they would use the whale oil to light lamps and heat homes and, and on and on and on. And this became such a big industry all over the world that the whales were almost driven to extinction. Even today, the whales are a, an endangered species. Um, and whaling, thankfully, is illegal in most countries. Japan, not so much. Um, but Rockefeller, he has all these oil, you know, things. And there was a byproduct from the oil refining process called gasoline. And no one knew what to do with it. It was just a waste product. So they would just throw it away or they just burn it or they just get, they get rid of it. The Rockefeller figured out, hold on, we can use this gasoline to power lamps, to power electricity generators, to power eventually to power cars, eventually to power all of these other things. Rockefeller, in the ultimate form of recycling, found a way to sell this waste product as something that everyone could use. And it was cheaper than whale oil. It was more plentiful than whale oil. And so long before whaling became illegal, it stopped being profitable. So people stopped buying whale oil. People stopped hunting the whales. Rockefeller saved the whales. Now, he didn't do that for that reason. He wanted to make money. But nevertheless, in many ways, thanks to Rockefeller, we still have whales. So thank you, Rockefeller. Advantages of a corporation. Legally regarded as a single entity or individual. So in, what this means then is, so for instance, in the United States, the police cannot just enter your home. The police can only enter your home under certain conditions. Either they have probable cause to enter your home, as in they heard someone screaming for help or something like that, or... <laughs> so, okay, how to preface this. My aunt, when she was in high school in the 90s, threw a lot of parties without her parents' permission. <laughs> And activities were going on that were not necessarily of a legal nature. But my aunt knew her rights. And so whenever she threw a party, she would cover the windows. And if the cops came to the door, she would not open the door. She would talk to them through the door. Because, because the windows are covered and because the door is not opened, the cops cannot observe a crime occurring, and so therefore they do not have probable cause to enter. Another way that cops can enter your home is if you invite them in. The other way that they can enter your home is if they have a warrant from the judge. So if, if the cops go to the judge and they say, hey, we're pretty certain they're selling meth in this house or whatever, then the judge could write a warrant and then they can enter your home. It is illegal for the cops to enter your home without probable cause, without a warrant, or without your permission. Because you as an American have rights. And these are very important rights that you need to keep in mind. Know your rights, read your constitution. Um, so then, the reason that you have those rights for your home is because you are an individual who owns the home or your parents own the home. You live there, you have residency there. And so there becomes a very interesting question of, well, what about these companies where there's not actually a single owner? It's a whole bunch of people that own it because they own stock. 
Do we have to get a warrant for every single person to do that? Do would they even have rights in that way? And so as part of a for the sake of legal um, expediency, I guess you could say, corporations that have you know hundreds or thousands of individual owners, corporations are treated legally as if they are an individual. So that means then that the police can't just raid Google for the same reason, because Google as a property owner, or I guess what you could say is the owners of Google have certain rights and they collectively own Google. So therefore Google has that right. The police cannot just go into Google. They have rights in that way. So that, that is what is meant by, you know, oftentimes there's this argument between uh, different groups of like, are corporations people? Well, no, not technically. There are groups of people, but just because we all group up, that doesn't mean we lose our rights. So therefore, for the sake of legal expediency, we treat a corporation as if it is a person. Another advantage of corporation can raise capital through selling shares of stock. It's able to transfer ownership of shares rather easily continues to exist after the original owner or owners die. That's a really important one. Limits the liability to stockholders. So that's really important. So it used to be back in the day, if you invested money in a company and that company took on a lot of debt and then went out of business, they failed. It used to be then that the debt collectors would go after the stockholders. Like, well, you own that part of this and you've got money and you this company owed debt, so cough up, money bags. But what's nice about the corporation is that it limits the liability. So if you buy stock for $100 and that company goes, it dies, then that means you only lost that $100, which sucks. But at the very least, debt collectors aren't coming after you. So all of these factors are very important and very useful in terms of a corporate structure. Alfred Krupp was the first industrialist to use the Bessemer process in Europe, known as the Cannon King. Krupp produced cast steel cannons and other weapons of war. Better medicine, nutrition, and health the population explosion that had begun during the 1700s continued through the 1800s. Between 1800 and 1900, the population of Europe more than doubled. They doubled in 100 years. This rapid growth was not due to larger families. In fact, families in most industrializing countries had fewer children. Instead, population soared because death rate fell. So fewer people were dying. Nutrition improved, thanks in part to improved methods of farming, food storage, and distribution. Medical advances and improvements in public sanitation also slowed death rates. Combating disease. So one of the huge things, huge things to keep in mind is that for a very, 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 very long time, no one really knew what caused diseases. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't really blame them. It's, I don't think it's fair to, you know, call people in the past stupid because they didn't know about germs. I mean, they didn't. They didn't have microscopes. And so no one really knew what caused these kind of diseases, like the Black Plague. So a lot of the times people would say, well, this is obviously a punishment from God. Well, probably not because we, but I'm thinking we're, I'm looking at this from a, a school teacher sitting at a computer from the 21st century. So I know about germs, you know about germs. The whole world now knows about germs because of the coronavirus. So it's not fair 
to judge our ancestors just because they didn't know something. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know that our descendants will make fun of us for. Most doctors scoff at the germ theory. Not until 1870 did French chemist Louis Pasteur clearly show the link between microbes and disease. Pasteur went on to make other co major contributions to medicine, including the development of vaccines against rabies and anthrax. He also discovered a process called pasteurization that killed disease-carrying microbes in milk. In the 1880s, the German doctor Robert Koch identified the bacterium that caused tuberculosis, a respiratory disease that claims about 30 million human lives in the 1800s. Tuberculosis is also known as consumption. So if you're ever watching some eight movie about the 1800s, like, I don't know, like Pride and Prejudice or something, and they say, she's caught the consumption. That's what they mean, tuberculosis. The search for a tuberculosis cure, however, took half a century. By 1914, yellow fever and malaria had been traced to microbes carried by mosquitoes. As people understood how germs caused disease, they bathed and changed their clothes more often and washed their clothes more often. And it's very convenient that they washed their clothes more often because it actually turns out the more you wash your clothes, the quicker they break down. But guess what? Because of industrialism, we now have a cheaper shirt that it's easier to buy. So you can wash it more often. Isn't that wonderful? Better hygiene helped decrease the rate of disease. Improving hospital care. By the 1840s, anesthesia was being widely used to relieve pain during surgery. The use of anesthetic gas allowed doctors to experiment with operations that had never before been possible. I mean, think about that. Think about having to do a surgery having someone cut you open and mess around inside you and you're still awake and you can feel it no wonder these no wonder these surgeries were difficult because the person you're doing it to is screaming in pain but <coughs> knock them out and you can do whatever you want i think anesthetic is like the best thing ever I, a few years ago, I had to get three root canals. Don't ask me why. I was, I was a dumb college kid and I didn't want to go to the dentist. That's why. Um, I had three root canals. That's where they drill into your tooth. They remove the insides of your tooth and then they shove rods into the tooth and then seal it up. And, all t and they're drilling and drilling and drilling. And the idea of doing that without a painkiller or something to numb my mouth, the idea of doing that without anesthetic makes me nauseous. Like it makes me want to throw up. The idea of someone drilling into my teeth without any, any anesthetic is just awful. Yet throughout the century, hospitals could be dangerous places. Um, and uh, sorry, when I was researching this and finding pictures, this was one of the strangest pictures I ever saw. It was like a, a way of deploying gas anesthetic to someone. Just a very strange drawing. Um, sorry. Throughout the century, hospitals could be very dangerous places. Surgery was performed with dirty instruments in dank rooms. Often a patient would survive an operation only to die days later of infection. I wonder why I didn't wash my hands. For the poor, being admitted to a hospital was often a death sentence. Wealthy or middle-class patients insisted on treatment in their own homes. And moving on. Quote, the very first requirement in a hospital, said British nurse Florence Nightingale, is that it should do the sick no harm, unquote. As an army nurse during the Crimean War, Nightingale insisted on better hygiene in field hospitals. After the war, she worked to introduce sanitary measures in British hospitals. She also founded the first, sorry, the world's first school of nursing. Good for you, Florence. We also have the English surgeon Joseph Lister discovered how antiseptics prevented infection. Good. So clean your tools. 
He insisted that surgeons sterilize their instruments and wash their hands before operating. Eventually, the use of antiseptics drastically reduced deaths from infection. Thank goodness. Can you imagine your doctor not washing their hands before they start working on you? That would just be awful. Also, Lister gave his name to Listerine. Isn't that fun? More you know. Population growth in major cities. Got Paris, Berlin, Antwerp, New York City. That's America. Look at that America going up. But overall, the trend for all of these places is an upward one. You can see here in Antwerp, it's kind of a little flat, but that might be because Antwerp was not as industrialized. We also see life expectancy during the Industrial Revolution. In 1850, life expectancy was 25. Oh my God. Sorry, I didn't know that. That's crazy. That means, that means I would be dead. Very likely I would be dead if I lived in 1850. But by 1910, it's past 50. And now today, we're upwards of like 80. And it's, if, if trends continue, hopefully, knock on wood, hopefully trends continue, we're looking at possibly the average life expectancy being upwards of 100 years. Some doctors and scientists predict that the first person to live to 150 is already alive. It could be you. Isn't that interesting? The first person Louis Pasteur vaccinated was a nine-year-old boy named Joseph Meister who had been bitten by a rabid dog. Meister failed to develop rabies. So this is back in the day when there, uh, there were no rules with, with science and medicine. You could just do whatever you wanted. Hey, I developed this thing. I haven't tested it. I don't know if it works. Let me stick your nine-year-old son with it. Okay, go ahead. That's, that's wild. <laughs> ah, that's just crazy. That's just so crazy. Okay. City life changes. As industrialization progressed, cities became, came to dominate the West. Cities grew as rural people streamed into urban areas for work. By the end of the 1800s, European and American cities had begun to take on many of the features of cities today. And I think that's a really important thing that I want to mention. I need to make sure that I mention it. The world that we live in right now, especially in terms of technology, traces itself back to the second industrial revolution. If you're listening to this on an iPhone or a computer and you're using electricity to do so, you should be very, very thankful that the second industrial revolution happened. Because otherwise, you wouldn't have any of these things. We would be a much poorer society. And going back to the life expectancies, I might be dead. So I'm very, very thankful to the industrial revolution. New cityscapes, growing wealth and industrialization altered the basic layout of European cities. So here we see an image of an older city. And we also have to remember, this is weird for Americans to think about just because, um, well, I mean like Europe, they have, like my, my wife was researching a cathedral in London. And that cathedral, was built in the year 1000. It is 1000 years old. The city of Paris was established by the Romans. These are very, very old buildings and old cities, old places with a lot of history. And it's weird for Americans to think about in that regard. We don't quite have that. Um, the closest that I can think of is Wapatki nearby, near in Flagstaff. Um, Wapatki was built around 1200 or so. And so, yeah, that's super old. And it's really a cool place to go to and imagine people living there. 
but it, it is not a full on city. It's, you know, it's a series of buildings. So it's, it's kind of weird for Americans to think, of, or like think about China, 4,000 years of history, or living in Egypt, they're the pyramids. The pyramids were built at the same time mammoths were alive. That's crazy. And so it, it's definitely strange for Americans to think about. But these old cities, they were built hundreds of years ago. So we see here the street. Does this street look wide enough for a car, let alone two cars? And so a lot of adaptations have to be made to a lot of these cities in order for industrial life to adapt. And so we see a series of urban renewals, rebuilding, or a, sorry, the rebuilding of the poor areas of a city took place in Paris in the 1850s. George Haussmann, chief planner of Napoleon III, destroyed many tangled medieval streets full of tenement housing. In their place, he built wide boulevards and splendid public buildings. So they're they're redesign they're trying to redesign various cities so that way they are more amenable to uh, the industrial life. Paved streets made urban areas more much more livable. First, gas lamps and then electric lights illuminated the night, increasing safety. Because I mean, think about it: if you're wandering through the dark, anyone can jump you. Cities organized police forces and expanded fire protection. Beneath the streets, sewage systems, sewage systems made cities much healthier places to live. Take away all the poop and the pee. City planners knew that clean water supplies and better sanitation methods were needed to combat epidemics of cholera and tuberculosis. And thank you sewers for making sure that diseases don't spread rapidly. In Paris, sewer lines expanded from 87 miles in 1852 to more than 750 miles by 1911. The massive new sewer systems of London and Paris were costly. They cut death rates dramatically. By 1900, apologies, by 1900, architects were using steel to construct soaring buildings. The Eiffel Tower, became the symbol of Paris and the heights to which modern structures could reach. American architects like Louis Sullivan pioneered a new structure, the skyscraper. In large cities, single family middle class homes gave way to multi story apartment buildings. That brings us to life in the slums. Despite efforts to improve cities, urban life remained harsh for the poor. Some working class families could afford better clothing, newspapers, or tickets to a music hall, but they went home to small cramped row, ho row houses or tenements in overcrowded neighborhoods. In the worst tenements in cities such as London and New York, whole families were often crammed into a single room that had little light and almost no ventilation. Less than one foot of space separated the buildings, and most tenements did not have running water. Bathrooms outside in the back might be shared by as many as 20 people. Unsanitary conditions and overcrowding meant diseases spread quickly. Unemployment or illness meant lost wages that could ruin a family, leaving it homeless. High rates of crime and alcoholism were a constant curse. Conditions had improved somewhat from the early Industrial Revolution, but slums remained a fact of city life. But again, things are improving. The poor over time are making more money. Things that the poor need to buy are costing less and less. Sewers and other technologies and medicine are improving life expectancy. Again, we have to compare like things with like things. And we have to compare what these people are living in as compared to what they left. And as time is going on, things are getting better. Now, that being said, 
I would not, sitting here as a school teacher in the 21st century, I would not want to go back in time and live like this. But perhaps am I saying that out of a point of, I don't know, time privilege, I guess you could say. We are a much wealthier society today than they were in the past. What would that be called? Future privilege, time privilege, I'm not sure. All right, moving on. The lure of city life. Despite their drawbacks, cities attracted millions. New residents were drawn as, as much by the excitement as by the promise of work. For tourists, too, cities were centers of action. Music halls, opera houses, theaters provided entertainment for every taste. Museums and libraries offered educational opportunities. Sports from tennis to bare knuckle boxing drew citizens of all classes. Tree lined parks offered a chance for fresh air, walks and picnics while reminding people of life in the country. There are a lot of reasons why people were moving to cities. The aerial view shows Paris around 1870 after being redesigned by George Houseman. And you can see so a lot of the streets are much wider now. They're able to accommodate cars and things like that. The working class wins new rights. Workers tried to improve the harsh conditions of industrial life. They protested low wages, long hours, unsafe conditions, and the constant threat of unemployment. At first, business owners and governments tried to silence protesters. By mid-century, however, workers began to make progress. Now, I'm a bit averse to using the term progress in the context of history, because progress really depends on what the goal is and whose goal it is. But in this context, I'll let it go, because we're clearly talking about the workers' goal, and they're progressing towards the workers' goal. The growth of labor unions. Workers formed mutual aid societies, self-help groups to aid sick or injured workers. A lot, in many ways, it was like insurance. Men and women joined socialist parties or organized unions. In 1830 and 1848, revolutions had broken out across Europe, sparked by political and social unrest. The revolts left vivid images of widespread worker discontent that governments could no longer ignore. By the late 1800s, most Western countries had granted all men the vote. Workers had, sorry, that should be clarified, all white men the vote. Most Western countries had granted all men the vote. Workers who won the right to organize unions to bargain on their behalf. Germany legalized labor unions in 1869. Britain, Austria, and France followed. By 1900, Britain had about 3 million union members. Germany had 2 million. The main tactic of union of unions was the strike or work stoppage. Workers used strikes to demand better working conditions, wage increases, and other benefits from their employer, employers. Violence was often a result of strikes, particularly if employers called the, in the police or hired non-union workers to keep their operations going. Now, one thing that's important to note, and you can see this especially like if you read Howard Zinn, is that very often this kind of violence that they're talking about was often started by the union themselves, by you know throwing bricks at so-called scabs. So scabs are non-union workers that are being brought in to try to break up the strike. Um, but that being said, that doesn't mean that the unions are completely guilty. The police and the National Guard have also, also started violence of their own. Pressured by unions, reformers, and working class voters, governments passed laws to regulate working conditions. Early laws forbade employers to hire very young children. Later laws outlined child labor, outlawed child labor entirely and banned the employment of women in mines. Well, what if you're a woman and you want to work in the mine? What about that? Other laws limited work hours and improved safety. By 1909, British coal miners had won an eight hour work day setting a standard for workers in other countries. In Germany and then elsewhere, 
Western governments established old age pensions, as well as disability insurance for workers who were hurt or became ill. These programs protected workers from dying in poverty once they were no longer able to work. Now, there's an interesting argument to be had. So this, the book is especially making the case that it was government and union action that led to these positive outcomes. However, not everyone agrees with that. There are some economists and historians, um, Robert P. Murphy, for instance, Thomas E. Woods, um, Thomas Sowell would make this argument. They make the argument that these positive trends were already happening, and then the government came in and passed a law. So, for instance, child labor was already, and the, Thomas Woods points this out, child labor was already being phased out because, I mean, adults are just more productive. The child labor was already being phased out well before the government banned it. Same goes for the eight hour workday or for safety things. And so I'm not gonna give an opinion, I'll leave it up to you to decide, but there are two sides of this argument. There's one side saying that these improvements were caused by the unions and government action. There's another side saying that no, these, these trends were already happening and then the government slapped on a law. I'll leave it up to you to decide which one is more correct. An improved standard of living. Wages varied throughout the industrialized world, with unskilled laborers earning less than skilled workers. Women received less than half the pay of men doing the same work. Farm laborers barely scraped by during the economic slump of the late 1800s. Periods of unemployment brought desperate hardships to industrial workers and helped boost union membership. Overall though, standards of living for workers did rise. Working class people began to benefit from higher wages and better working conditions. They too were able to afford a larger variety of goods and services. Many benefited from the growing movement to provide public education. Some were able to get access to healthcare. Efforts to curb diseases led to vaccination programs that reached into poor communities. Some workers were able to move out of overcrowded slums into the outer ring of cities and travel to work on subways and trolleys. Despite improvements in the standard of living, however, a large gap divided workers from the middle class. Oh, I'm sorry, this is showing standards of living, rising standards of living. This is the world population living in extreme poverty. So extreme poverty is defined as $1.90 per day or less. So imagine living on $1.90 a day. That's all you can spend. I don't think I could even drive to work. I probably burn more gas than that just getting to work. So as a percentage of the global population, upwards of 90% of the entire world lived on less than $1.90 a day in 1820. 90% of people in the entire world in 1820 lived in extreme poverty. But as time has gone on, and as industrialization has spread and as free markets have spread and as capitalism has grown, this number has gone down. We are on the verge, ladies and gentlemen, we are on the verge of wiping out extreme poverty in the world. Some people estimate that by the end of the decade, so by 2030, no one, will be living in extreme poverty. Isn't that incredible? And in a very short amount of time, isn't that amazing? I think about that all the time. And it's amazing. The lives of people all over the world are improving. And with that, I'm going to have to say goodbye.
thank you very much for uh, watching. Hope you have a good day.